looking at our back monitor and just miniaturizes like, oh, we gotta get that up. And then as I'm walking up, I'm looking at the trees going, blueberry, chocolate, banana, nut, 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 so those of you who are watching online, I'm sorry you're missing out, but join us next week. We'd love to have you join us here in person. Well, good morning, everyone, and we are glad that you are all here. If you are watching online, please let us know in the comments so that we can uh, just know that you're here. And if you need anything, if you have a prayer request, put that in there as well, because when we get to that time of the service, we have a prayer warrior that will be coming up, Denise, and she will pray over you and for you and with you. So as we join in her in that same prayer. So please do that for us. This coming Wednesday night, we are, how we are almost halfway, we're a third of the way through the chosen season three. Season four doesn't come out till next year. That's depressing. But you know what? It butts right up against our Advent series. So there'll just be, we'll have a nice continuous flow. So that'll be nice. But this Wednesday night, we'll be on episode three of the chosen. So we'll watch the episode and then have a discussion, certainly our time of prayer. This week's episode is called Physician, Heal Yourself. And in this episode, Jesus returns to Nazareth on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. He joins the town's holiday festivities with Mary and gives a sermon at the evening service. So as you all well know, there's a whole lot more than that. But that's just a little capture of what is going on. And certainly, if uh, you need to catch up, you go out to our website and click on Grow, then click on The Chosen, and then you can choose uh, the Play Store, whether that's Google or Apple, or you can just watch it online, clicking the online watch, or if you've got a streaming service such as Netflix or Amazon, they are carrying it on there as well. If you don't have any of that, go out to The CW tonight, and you can watch it right on broadcast TV, which is so awesome. Um, then, uh, then we have a little bit of a break. A little bit of breaks are always nice. Uh, on November 4th, we'll have our next men's breakfast, so we invite all the men of the church to join us at 9 a.m. for that. We'll have a free meal, a time of fellowship, and a devotion that morning. Uh, if you've not been before, let us know. We'll, and you need a way to get there, we'll get you here. So just let us know about that. That is going to be a busy day. Because on that day, we're going to watch the third and final movie that has been made, at least in this series, of The Chronicles of Narnia, called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And the, the crux of this one is while they're uh, visiting their annoying cousin, Eustace, Lucy, Lucy and Edmund come across a painting of a majestic ship called the Dawn Treader. Suddenly, the painting comes to life and draws the youth's into Narnia where they meet their old friend, not Prince Caspian as we learned in the last movie, but King Caspian. And Caspian is on a quest to find the seven lost lords of the Telmar, whose swords will save Narnia from an evil green mist that enslaves men's minds and bodies. If you want to know more about it, go out to Grace Street Church, click on Grace Street Cinema, and uh, or just go out to our social media. Uh, we've got stuff up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and yeah, we've got a TikTok. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the kind of engagement we get out of those. So um, it's out there. Uh, you can watch the trailer. For those of you that are watching online, once the worship list goes in there, at the very end of that worship list is the uh, trailer for the movie. And then finally, uh, next month we have Orange Track Racing. We will be concluding season 18. And we will have our monthly races. So normal time span, but plus, because we take, we kept all of the first place cars for each class and we do a double elimination. So it takes a little bit longer to get the car of the year. So then they get a trophy for car of the year and then uh, we'll tally up all the points for the year and the people that in each class that place first through fourth will uh, get a trophy. So for those of you who are here, you can see up on top of the, in the coffee area, some of the past year's trophies. Um, a couple of those were uh, unfortunately some folks that had passed and the families wanted us to have those back to display. So uh, that's why we were blessed with those. <coughs> 
And then finally, Diane's going to be throwing in the uh, worship set for all of you. Uh, Mark has done an amazing job of choosing music for today. Some songs that I haven't heard in a while. Some songs that I haven't worshipped to in a while. And so I encourage you to uh, watch those if you're watching online to click on that link. With that, that does end our announcements unless somebody has another announcement they want to give. I'm not going to go into Ratchet's Rules of Order. So you can know more. Oh, let's call my hearts. Let's think about God and what he has done for us and amazing things he has done. If we look outside, we see complete change from what the last few days have been. The sun is out. And there's a beauty in the air because we've got the clouds and the blue sky and the sun, but then we have the changing colors of the leaves making for this beautiful tapestry, this beautiful painting that God has given to us. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this, this announcement that you are still in control, that you are still here and you are still with us, Father. Be with us this morning as we hear the message. Let us use it to make changes in our lives that will allow us to become closer to you. We thank you and praise you and all God's children said, Amen. Mark has picked uh, 1 Timothy 1, 5 and 7 for our call to worship. And it says this, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. But some people have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they are talking about, even though they speak so confidently. Before I kind of dive into that a little bit, I got a little story for you. Last night, Diane and I went to one of our favorite places to eat, because we were down in Iowa City, so we went to Jimmy Jack's. And no, there's no, no uh, monetary, or uh, we don't get free food mm -hmm. out of it. But we were down there, and we were sitting there, and it seemed like, as soon as we got there, a charter bus pulled up. It was a girls' volleyball team. And they were getting it to go, but the interesting thing was the conversation I had, that I was listening to. It was a meaningless discussion. It was a discussion about what's going on in the Middle East. It was a discussion on how uh, they feel like Israel started it all. It's this turned around view of what is happening and they were actually not understanding that there's a difference between the Palestinian people and Hamas and they weren't there long enough and it wasn't a kind of a conversation you just jump into with a bunch of teenager early 20 something girls but I was just I was, I was listening to this and I was remembering what Mark had chosen for our call to worship, I'm thinking of these meaningless discussions. Even though they sounded so confident in what they were talking about, they have been misled because of all of the different influences that they have, whether that's social media, uh, maybe a professor, what have you. And that is what Paul's intention in this passage is about. It's to instruct Timothy on how to act as a representative of Paul's, but not just of Paul's, but of Christ. And he begins with the problem of false teaching in Ephesus. And there is a very close connection between our Christian belief and that practice of that Christian belief. And I was reminded from Galatians 5, 6, and this is the second part of uh, that verse that says, what is important, what is important is faith expressing itself in love. Now, arguing about the details of the Bible can send us off into some very interesting, irrelevant discussions. Down the rabbit hole, if you, if you please. But they ultimately miss the entire point of God's message. This is a message that, uh, as Mark gives us uh, the sermon today, and brings us this message two by two, He's sending the disciples out for the first time without him to spread the word. And what they have to do is they must remain 
focus. They must make Jesus their main focus. And here's the good news. And this is part of the message that they're taking out, is that we get salvation through Jesus Christ. And this is the main point of the scriptures. So, Father, as we prepare to hear this message two by two that you have given to Mark, we thank you. We thank you for just bringing these words. And, and it's almost like sometimes when we're writing a sermon, Father, that they just appear on the, on the paper or on the screen because that is what you do. You give us these messages and you prepare us to go out just as Jesus is sending out the disciples two by two. You so send us. Let us hear this message this morning. Place an anointing on Pastor Mark this morning as he gives this message. And we thank you for what it will be and how we can take it out into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? As he said, it's a beautiful day, kind of. Uh, clouds kind of gray in areas and everything, so we have kind of a mixed bag of things out there. But still in all, it's a beautiful day if you have the right perspective. And that, that's really the key to life, if you think about it. So I got some questions for you this morning. But first, I want to start by saying this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, have you ever had your back up against the wall and you're ready to do battle? You know, ready to go for it, right? Ever had the realization then that you might be able to win the battle but lose the war in the process, in the bigger picture, when you really put things in perspective? So in life, we really need to choose our battles carefully. We need to know what we should expend energy on and, and think about things and think about the bigger picture and maybe look at things a little bit more carefully before we choose to do that battle. Sometimes forgiveness is better than the fight. Before we enter into battle, we need to understand we need to forgive more than what we need to fight. Sometimes that fight and many times that fight is not worth the circumstance that's being fought over. And so I, I, I look at the world today and I look at the political turmoil that we have right now and our own government up there and what a mess that is and all the infighting that's going on. And, you know, they're choosing these battle lines, you know, and they're going to draw these battle lines out there. And this, this group over here is fighting for this and this group over here is fighting for this. But see, the battle... The battle, the war that's going on out here is much bigger than these little puny little squabbles that are going on. The war is going on out here are people's lives that are being affected by their puny little battles. They might win this battle over here, but guess what? That caused us a major problem over here. And that's what a lot of it is in, in the world today. So many times that fight that they're fighting isn't really worth that circumstance that they're fighting about. And so we, we need to take a different look. We need to step back. We need to look at the bigger picture, that, that overall thing that we're trying to accomplish. And I'm using the, the terminology for war and things like that because it's true. It's, it's like there's a war going on. And if you take a look at the situation over in Israel right now and, and Palestine and and what's going on over there. It's a small faction of people that are entirely making this huge war that's going to affect the lives of millions and millions of people that may not agree with this small faction over here. And that's the problem. And, and then there's people who are, are the disinformation groups that are out there today. And Terry was kind of talking about that. Uh, we had a whole group of students this week from Harvard University um, that joined together to come against Israel because Palestine, those Palestinians, you know, they deserve that land. They were there first. Well, then if you back up history uh, over the last 7,000 years, 
the Israelites have always occupied that territory. Always. Always. And so you have to look at that whole thing and you have to look for where does the right belong? But what they're squabbling about are more ideologies than it is territory when it gets right down to it. And so they have to put things in the right perspective. Is it worth killing millions and millions and millions of people over this small ideology that they have? Not really. I'm sure the people who are being killed don't really want to die for that cause. But see, their innocence in the battle, their innocence in that war. Well, many things in life come down to perspectives. And in this episode of The Chosen that we, we saw on Wednesday night, we see a lot of different dynamics in play. We saw somebody who, who had those same kind of ideologies in there with Matthew and his parents. And his, and his father said, you're dead to me, get away from me, I no longer have a son. Until he thought about it a little bit, a little later on, and came back to it. And he goes, oh, I need to atone. Matthew knew that he was wrong because he rejected his heritage and his people in the process. So they were trying to make amends for that. But see that battle that was fought earlier on? You're dead to me. There was a lot of damage done there. We have to be, we have to be quicker to look at forgiveness up front than to fight that battle, to make those battle lines that are drawn. And so we see that in, in a lot of different things. We see the cultural differences between the Jews and the Romans in here right now and we see Jesus at work in all of those things we saw reconciliation between Matthew and his parents because once they thought about it guess what that fight that they fought that battle that they fought wasn't worth it to begin with and so they reconciled but what did it take for them to reconcile well Matthew went to work for Jesus and then his parents came and heard Jesus speak and it convicted their hearts and it made them choose their their choices in life it made them change their perspective of what they were looking at and then they got to thinking well guess what it wasn't worth that to begin with our son is worth more than what that battle was about and so they reconciled and then we see a lot of different changing of perspectives of those who are sworn enemies being brought together for a common good. And we see Christ at work in examples of each one of these things as we go through. We see that forgiveness needs to be articulated in order to make a change. People have to know you're willing to forgive. They have to be willing to receive the forgiveness. That has to be articulated. That means there's a working, inner working between the two. So forgiveness needs to be articulated in order to make a change. And we learn that if it's necessary, that we need to use words to express that forgiveness. Does that make sense? Because a lot of times we can do things for people who have wronged us in the past. And that kind of convicts their hearts because we see we're giving them forgiveness. We're doing things for them. We didn't have to say a word. And then they come back later and they go, well, hey, guess what? I think I was wrong. And I wronged you. So sometimes we don't have to just come up and say it to their face, but we can do things. If necessary, use words to express that forgiveness. Sometimes we need to see similar life struggles played out in the lives of others on screen to realize what we have to do in our own lives, and that's what I love about this show. Now, from what I understand right now, I, I was reading some things that I get all these emails from Angel Studios and from The Chosen. And right now, they're on track to have reached over five million people this year so far, and it is now going into 13 other countries in five different languages so far. It's being translated into different languages to spread around the world. I think this is going to be a life-changing event worldwide. And if you ever notice, there's no battle lines here. 
but it is changing people's perspectives on life and what's really important. So when we take a look at this uh, on screen, we take a look at the right directions that these people are seeing and we see a uh, Roman soldier, Gaius, and uh, his heart is being changed step by step as he goes through these things. And we see Atticus, who's a, you know, the Roman equivalent of a CIA officer out here. And he's trying to figure out what's going on with this Jesus of Nazareth, because he's, he's seen firsthand miracles take place. He doesn't understand it. He finds it hard to try and connect with his Roman gods, with his background. But if you notice what happened in this episode, I thought was fantastic, is when they, they went to meet about the tent city that was going on there and they were going to uh, tell them what's going on in, in Nazareth in there and they're, they're going to tell them what's going on in Capernaum and they have this massive massive tent city that's forming outside because the word is spreading about Jesus and people are coming from all over the region to come and hear and see this Jesus to find out what he's truly about and so the first thing is in the Roman culture is you go in and you trample your oppressors, period. You do away with them. You wipe out the opposition, then you no longer have to worry about the opposition. That's what they're trained to do. But if you notice what happened in here, because they've seen Jesus, and he, Jesus is working in their lives, they just don't know it yet. But you see a softening and a changing in their perspective. And so they go, to, they go in to report in and, and tell him about the tent city. And, of course, he wants to just strike them all down, you know, wipe them out. And he goes, well, hey, you know, maybe you should think about this. Instead of trampling over the people over here, why don't you collect, tax, you know, collect taxes from them instead? So what this guy would normally do is say, yeah, we'll go in there, we'll take a legion in and wipe the people out. But you see, his heart's being changed. His perspective has been changed towards these people. And you see this, this change in perspective going on in the people. And it's very, very important for us. And I know I'm talking about perspective quite a bit in the last few messages that I've given, but it's very, very true. We have to change our perspective in order to change our situation in our life. And it's, it's a fundamental need that most people have. So, again, I'm going to talk about it again. Yes, most of this is artistic license because you're not going to open it up and see Atticus did this or Atticus did that in the Bible. Most of it is artistic license being applied, but it is documented uh, both in Jewish historians and in Roman members of the Roman military who came to change their life as a result of encounters with Christ and his disciples. And that is written in the Bible. So when we see this, it's, it's not far-fetched, but they're kind of taking us culturally in there to take a look at these things and understand that, yes, change can happen. Perspectives can change. And something unexpected happened when these changes were made. And it's that that has left questions to, who is this Jesus? And they're asking themselves about it. Who is this Jesus? Because this is completely different from any of the other rogue preachers that were bopping around in the day. So I have a question for you today. We've laid the foundation now. Now comes the work part. If you were stopped on the street and asked that very question, how would you answer? How would you answer? What would you say? How would you describe what Jesus is doing and why he is doing it? Think about that once. Might be harder than what you really think. Might be harder to describe exactly what Jesus can do in your life, for your life, and how he can change your life. Hmm. So, would they just believe you? Or would they dismiss you and say you're out of touch with the world? Yeah, most of the time anymore, you're out of touch with the world. They're going to dismiss you. They're going to say, hey, you're just one of those nutcases. You're, you're one of those Bible thumpers, right? 
But in today's society, you're more likely to be dismissed than taken seriously. And again, that all comes down to a matter of perspectives, right? The lens through which the world looks is tainted and skewed with political correctness, biases, conjectures. And as I said in my last sermon, we live in a canceled culture society, and if you simply see things differently, you might be canceled by those other people. See, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, have nothing to do with the cancel culture. They have no place in a cancel culture. Because you're thinking different from they are. This goes back to choosing your battle and losing the war. But it all comes down to a matter of perspectives. All comes down to a matter of perspectives. Now look at when Jesus was teaching and preaching. It was no different in those times because the lenses may have been a little bit different back then, but the mores of the society really weren't that different than what we have in our world today. Dare to cross the line, and you may get canceled sometimes permanently. So if you, if you cross the line with the Romans, they'll come over and trample you to death with a horse. They have no problem doing that. You might get canceled permanently. Or if you violated Jewish rules, the laws, the 603 laws that they have, if you violated one of those laws, then they're going to come out and cancel you. And that's the Pharisees of the day. But is that really truly what God wanted? Were they actually doing what God wanted them to do in that situation? Or were they simply doing what they wanted to do to support their position? And we pretty much know it's they were just wanting to support their position. So from a Christian perspective, we need to reevaluate the environment that we live in. Okay? And by that I mean if we're surrounded by negativity and constantly in fear, it will definitely have an effect on our perspective that we have upon any given situation, let alone your life at that point in time. So we have to look past that current circumstance, and we have to look at the bigger picture. We have to search for that bigger picture to find out what it is that God wants for us in our lives. Not just simply where the current situation is, but we have to change our perspective to look at the bigger picture, to look at what it could be like, what it would be like if we were to make a change in our lives. And that's the key. If it does, it can change your actions and your character and you might lose, suit, might lose sight of yourself in the process. So if we, if we stay stuck on our circumstance and we keep that perspective, we're never going to change. We're going to stay right where we're at. But in order to change our lives, we have to change our perspective. And that's key. That's kind of the first step. So there's a line in this episode, that, and I hope you guys caught it on Wednesday night. None of you is what you are. And I think it's a phenomenal line. When Jesus said that to his disciples, what do you think it meant? What do you think he was trying to tell them at that point in time? Well, each one of them, as we've come to know, had a whole different character, right? And they had a whole different demeanor. Each one of them had a little bit different demeanor. We have those who are ready to go to battle and fight the Romans out. And we had those who were just trying to reestablish who they were in their lives. See, he didn't pick religious leaders during the day. He went out to everyday common people with common everyday problems. Each one of those brought their own problems along with that character that goes with it. He was trying to prepare them to go out for their own ministry. He says, none of you are what you are. Meaning, forget about who you were in the past. Forget about all those things. I want you to change your perspective to who you are now. Because he was ready to change them from being disciples to being apostles. And apostles means they are people who are sent. And they're sent to do a mission. So he was trying to prepare them to go out for their own ministry. And they were going to go out two by two, but this time without Jesus with them without his presence. And the first reaction is disbelief when they, they were afraid to go out on their own. They, they said, hey, we're not ready to do this. We just started. 
We just started. He needed to change their perspective from one of self-reliance to one of God-reliance instead. And that's the key right there. A lot of times we're so self-reliant on ourselves that we fail to include God in on the process. And then it usually doesn't work out all that well for us in the, in the process. And so we may not end up where we need to be in life or where we want to be in life or where we should be according to God's plan for our life because we relied on ourselves and the decisions that we make by ourselves. And that's key. We have to include God in it. See, none of them by themselves was ready. But with God, they were more than ready to go out. And he was trying to tell them is, if you want to go out in life and you want to go out and do this ministry and you want to speak and, and teach in my name, they had to have a different way of looking at themselves. They couldn't see themselves as who they were in the past who they came from, fishermen, or whatever. See, they were going to face difficulty on the road, and lots of it. They were going into some unfriendly territories, but he also told them, hey, don't take it personally. If they reject you, they are really rejecting me. Dust off your sandals and move on. Don't stay in that situation. Don't hang around in that negativity, because that's going to affect your outcome and your perspective. Dust off the sandals and move on. Move on out. See, and in the end then, they'll pay for their insolence. And that's what he's telling them. Let me fight that battle. You don't need to fight it yourselves. Luke 9, 1 through 5 says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there until you depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. As a testimony against them. So Jesus was attempting to change the way the disciples were thinking about the mission that they were getting ready to undertake. And in the process, it got very, very real for them. Very real for them. He was giving them a kind of exodus, if you will. We'll go back into the, into the early Bible. They're giving them a kind of an exodus. Go out on your own. Don't depend on yourselves. Don't take any food, money, weapons, a change of clothes. Don't take anything with you. Nothing whatsoever. Because God will provide for you. I need you to rely on God. I'm sending you out. You must trust me and trust God for your food, for your protection. You must fully rely on God. See, in the process, he was building their faith in a real way. In a real way. Kind of put your money where your mouth is type scenario. He told them that they may have to follow his example and lay down their lives for the ministry. Now, you can't get much more real than that. That's a heck of a commitment. But see, it wasn't all doom and gloom. He also gave them the powers and the authority that God gave him to heal the sick and in the lame and to cast out demons. Real miracles. In addition, he told them, in effect, don't let the cancel culture deter you from the bigger plan here. I've got it handled. Rely on me. Rely on God. Luke 10, 16 then goes and says it this way. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Now, if we go on and we take that all the way back into, into Revelation, in the book of Revelation, what's it tell us in there? Those who reject God will end up in a fiery pit for eternity. Now the apostles now, they're no longer disciples, they're apostles. He made them that. And, and I love the line in, in, the, in the show. He says, I don't feel any different. <laughs> you know, what happened? I'm not ready. I don't feel any different. You gave me all this power. So the apostles now were being sent out to do the work of God, but it was very different than what the people were going out to see than what they had been 
used to a whole different perspective, right? Jesus chose common people, not religious leaders. He chose people from varied walks of life, people with problems, people with hurts, people with a past. But see, the past does not determine your future. And that's a key. I keep telling everybody that all over and over and over again because that is so critical to change your way of thinking. Your past does not determine your future, who you can be, who you will be if you rely on God because God's got the master plan. And see, that perspective was something that they all needed to embrace. They couldn't rely on who they were before. They had to rely on God. They had to rely on Jesus. They had to rely on what they had seen and heard from Jesus in order to have life going forward. And that builds their faith. None of you is what you are. And by that, he was telling them that they're each fearfully and wonderfully made by God and that they had worth in his eyes, regardless of their past. They had a future serving God. So yesterday we had devotions at Orange Track as we always do and I borrowed a penny from Diane yesterday morning because I failed to bring one with me. And I held up the penny and I said, does everybody know what this is? They said, yeah, it's a penny. And what's it worth? And one person said one cent. And another person said, it's not really anything, it's just scrap copper. So you just collect them all together. And so I said, well, you know, that's, that's the thing is Dad passed away, and he had this bag full of change and everything, and I was going through it. And so I was looking up at the coin collector stuff in there, and I was looking at all these different pennies. And there was a penny in there that had a worth of $135. One penny. One penny. Now, on face value, it only says one cent. But see, as a collector, because it's rare, and there's not many of them left, it had a much higher value. And it was a matter of perspective from one person who says, oh, it's only worth one cent, to this person over here who says, yeah, it's worth this. And it's the same with us and it's the same with people. Now, there's a lot of people out here who got devalued. The value of a penny back in 1924, you could go out for five cents and buy an entire loaf of bread. Now you need... 500 pennies to buy one loaf of bread. There's a difference. And it's a matter of how things have changed. But see, that penny has been devalued over time because of a lot of different factors. And a lot of times we devalue people the same way. We don't see them as having a value, but see, God sees the worth in these people. And that's what I'm talking about here when, when it says in here that none of you is what you are and by telling you that they were fearfully and wonderfully made by God and they had worth in those eyes. Every person has worth in God's eyes. Regardless of their past, they have a future with God. And it's the same for us. Now, it was really cool because I read a story uh, when I was preparing the devotion. And it was about a scout troop that went out and they were just asking everybody to collect pennies. And they collect pennies, they collected pennies. They had over $1,200 worth of pennies. And they took it down to the local shelter and they donated the $1,200 worth of pennies to that local shelter to help the people out that needed it the most. Now, what was the worth of that penny for those people who were helped out? wasn't the face value of a penny, I'll tell you that. It made a difference in their lives. It changed lives. Now, they could have taken that $1,200 and done something different with it, but they decided to help build the worth of other people who were down on their luck. And that's what serving God is all about. That's what this is all about. Jesus enabled them to do his good works by his spirit dwelling within them. And this is the same for us today, regardless of who we were, by accepting Jesus Christ in our hearts, we died to our old self, and we became new in the eyes of God. We have a new purpose. We have a new worth in the eyes of God. Who amongst us is worthy to be healed? And the answer to that is no one. No one. Who amongst us is worthy to be saved? 
No one. But by the grace of God, we are healed. By the grace of God, we are saved because he sees our worth. He makes us worthy. So they were sending the apostles out to do the work of God by themselves. They weren't worthy. They weren't ready. They weren't doing anything. But by the grace of God, they are. And they can. And they will. And they did. Disciples went out. Apostles now. They were preaching and performing signs and wonders, healings and miracles, casting out name, uh, demons in the name of Jesus, and being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. And it spread like wildfire. Is it really that different from what we do to each other and for each other here? Lifting each other up in prayer for those who are in need, helping to feed the hungry, helping to, uh, those out who are less fortunate bringing in clothes and blankets and gloves and just in time for cold weather to come. And can we do more? Yes. Yes, we can. We can be the voice of Jesus to them as well, giving them that good news, giving them the hope that they need in their life, giving them that restoration power that Jesus gives to us. Yes. Preaching and teaching good news, the word of God to them. Yes. It may be the only true example they see of God in action in the world today. And unfortunately, that's really true. It might be the only one they see. And it's up to us. And it's up to us. When Jesus called the disciples to follow them, he gave them examples of how to treat those around them, meeting the people where they were, helping those who needed help, not because they deserved it, but because it was the good and right thing to do. See, we can't put a, a, a price on it and say, you're not worthy. We can't judge anybody. God made them worthy. God makes us worthy to be able to go and help them. See, it's not because they deserved it, because it was a good and right thing to do. Being the hands of feet of God in the world. <coughs> so have you heard that calling? That still small voice that calls you to help another person? See, that's the spirit of the living God asking you to be his hands and feet. That's how we make a difference in this world today. Not by choosing battle, not by drawing battle lines. By wiping those battle lines out. Getting rid of those battle lines. Changing our hearts, changing our perspectives to reflect God. We are to be God's representatives. That means we are to represent God to everyone. And that is the spirit of the living God asking you to be his hands and feet. That's how we make the difference in the world today. We cancel the cancel culture with the love of God. And to do that, we need to fully rely on God. To trust him to enable us to do his work. Are we alone worthy to do his work? No. None of us is what you are. But with Jesus, we are more. With Jesus, we are more. Romans 8, 37 tells us this. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. So much that he died for us. Jesus is sending us out today for the lost and the least to bring them that good news, to change their perspective to those who would hear it. Are you spreading the word? Are you talking the talk? Are you walking the walk? I'd like to challenge each and every one of us to invite two or more to attend church this month. We got 15 more days before the month ends, offering a ride if they need it. So I have a question. Are you willing to be the hands and feet of God in these troubled times? Are you willing? Pray with me this prayer this morning. And it'll be in our notes and on the screen for those people online. Lord, you have shown me through your life and teachings that true greatness comes from service. Help me to model my life after you, after your example, and put the needs of others before my own. As I go about my day, please give me eyes to see the lonely, the hurting, and the marginalized. Awaken our compassion to recognize the dignity and humanity within each and every one of your children. 
regardless of their creed or color, their wealth or their environment. May God's grace awaken our souls and inspire us to see the world as God sees it. Help us to rely on you more fully to enable us to provide for those less, less fortunate than ourselves and bring a blessing to them. Strengthen us with the power of the Holy Spirit to be your hands and feet in this broken world. Amen. morning as I was doing my morning devotions, I was reading from Jeremiah 31 and 32, and it's the thread of the gospel, or the scriptures, beginning then is Jesus, and this message that going out two by two that the disciples were sent to do and what we are commanded to do by the Great Commission. Well, that same passage is echoed by the writer of Hebrews in chapter 8. Starting at verse 8, it says, But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to their covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. As I was thinking about communion this morning, that's exactly what he has done. He has wiped away all of it. He has written it on our hearts and in our minds. And those who say profess not to believe, it is written on their hearts and in their minds as well. Luke records it this way. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take this cup and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of heaven uh, or kingdom of God has come. Then he took some bread, he gave thanks to God, then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying this, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he continues saying, After supper he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. If you grab one of the new cups, I just want to warn you so you don't, you want to take the bread out first. body of Christ broken for you, take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. How blessed are we that we can come together without fear of retribution, fear of death, 
fear of someone storming in. That we can come together and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ each and every week. Father, we thank you for this freedom that you have given us. Father, for those that are under attack, regardless of where they are in the world, Father, for being a child of me, for declaring that you are God and that your Son is their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for them. And we pray that they would not give you up. We pray that the same were to happen to us, that we would not give you up either, Father, that you would continue to grow our faith deeply as you, we would a plant into the soil. Don't let us wither at the first thing that comes. Father, thank you that you have given us the Spirit. Thank you that you have given us your word and put it on our hearts and minds, Father. And I just pray that we can take the challenge that Pastor Mark gave us this morning. And regardless of whether they accept it or not, Father, that we invite two or more to join us in worship. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. everyone here and kind of an overall general prayer. All right, Holy Spirit be with me this morning. I'm going to start with Psalm 68, 32 through 35. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides the ancient skies, above who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. You are awesome, O oh God, in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Father God, you know all things and are above all powers and authorities here on earth and the universe. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We praise you for who you are and give all honor and glory to you as you settle the Israel and Hamas conflict. Put everything in place as you wish it to be, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And Father God, we thank you for Joe, and we lift him up to you this morning for his knee surgery on the 17th. We ask the Holy Spirit to be in that surgery room. We ask for clarity for the doctor and the teams of nurses to know exactly what needs to be done for a great outcome for Joe's excuse me, healing. Let his healing be swift, giving him the mobility he needs, and thank you, Jesus, for the blessing. Father God, we lift up Becky. Her rheumatoid arthritis is causing her back pain, or lots of pain, and she's lost her friend Bob, whom she had known for 25 years. Father God, just be with Becky. Surround her with loving care. Surround her with Christian people who know her and just bless her today. Comfort her and, and just give her peace that passes all understanding, Father God. Uh, just be with her, Lord Jesus. Help her to know she is loved. And I pray for this person's family also. Comfort those people who have lost their loved one. Be with them, Lord Jesus. And help them with all the things that come with them. Help them to know you are God and that you are there with them through it all. In Jesus, I pray. Father God, there are so many things to pray for. We pray for healing for those that are here today and those that are online and on our prayer list. I pray the blood of Jesus over them. Wash them. Cleanse them that they may be healed. Open our minds to read your word, to deliver healing over our bodies. For your word is, brings power and healing as we speak it out loud. In Psalm 71, 20 through 21, though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, 
You will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once again. We praise you, O oh God, for the healings we are about to receive and give you all the glory and honor and praise. I pray that you will grant work, shelter, and food for the homeless. Help them up and out of their situations. Help them to feel your Holy Spirit living among them, Father. And let us not forget that Jesus loves us so much that he died for us. And he is always with us if we just ask him to be there. In Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This uh, brings us to the end of our online portion of our service this morning. Uh, there'll be the uh, music is listed. The link for the music is going to be listed in our notes. So please uh, click on that. Um, I, I think it's a good collection of, of songs which should speak to our hearts today as well. Uh, let's go to God for this blessing. Dear Lord Jesus, every good and perfect gift is a blessing from you, and you have blessed us with so much. We ask that you would use us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing difficulties, in need of healing, in need of hope. Make us a channel of your blessing, a channel through whom your love and your peace and your joy would flow out from us, through us, and to others. May we be your hands and feet to bless others. May you guide our feet to places where we can go to be a blessing. May our speech be so that we may speak your words of comfort and encouragement and to speak truth in love. Give us the grace. Enable us and embolden us to be available when others are in need. And Lord, we pray that you would increase in our lives and that we may decrease before others so that the blessings of you pour through us to others. May you draw each and every one of us closer to you into your arms, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God, that your grace is sufficient for all of your children, including those that are facing persecutions, facing death, facing dangers in many parts of this torn world. But Lord, help us realize that we are all your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are all in one in you. And that pain that that individual believers are suffering becomes a communal distress for the body of Christ. And so, Lord, we lift up all of those who are having to contend with so many dangers and difficulties in the world. Comfort and strengthen each person who is suffering. Draw us close to each and every one of us so that we may, in your strength, persevere in these troubled times and in doing so bring glory to you and serve as a faithful witness to those that are lost in their sins. Help us to show forth your grace and your goodness as a beacon to others, a light to shine forth in their light, directing them to you, Lord. Comfort and surround each hurting heart and bless those who are in need of healing. Bring relief to those who are in need and keep each one of us firm in the faith that we have through you, Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you, Lord, that there is not one of your children who is lost to your eyes. And we lift.